there. Wow. Big crowd. Uh, Woody's a lifelong resident of Ashland. He lives on Center Street in the house that his grandparents built in 1921. And he was a, he's graduate of Randolph Bacon, uh, retired from the Virginia Employment Commission as an administrator for the Commonwealth's Unemployment Benefits Program, and he currently serves on our board at the Ashland Museum. So, with no further ado, we shall move. And I really appreciate everybody showing up here. Uh, you must lead a boring life to find the hottest thing, find the hottest thing in, in sound. But no, I, I, the museum, really appreciate your supporting these history talks and coming tonight particularly. And to the Randolph Baker students, thanks so much. I don't fool myself in thinking that you were just walking down the hall and think, oh, there's another lecture tonight. I really don't like to hear it. I expect that was some pressure applied. <laughs> but that's okay. We're glad you came. Thank you. Thank you. Um, speaking of pressure, I have done this presentation eight or nine times, so I really should feel pressured when I do it tonight. But there is a little bit of extra here that uh, does apply some pressure. And that is the person that I learned a whole lot about history from, my history professor at Randolph Macon, Dr. James Scanlon, is here tonight. <laughs> so, Dr. Scanlon, please give me that passion for you. <laughs> Okay, a little qualifier before, before I start. I gave this presentation some time ago, maybe a year or two ago, and I gave it to a group of seventh graders at Liberty Middle, a group of history students, seventh grade. By the time I finished my presentation, over half the class was asleep. <laughs> now, I say that for you insomniacs out here, this might be your lucky night. <laughs> so, I have always been interested in, in Ashland history, just fascinated. I mean, after all, I, I grew up here. My parents grew up here, my grandparents. I have greats and great greats who spent a good part of their life in Ashland. And over the years, I've just heard so many stories. I wish I could, I could remember all of them, which I can't. But it is, I mean, you've got to admit, Ashland is an interesting spot, right? It really is. It's been a lot going on in this town over its 100 and, what, 70 years or so of history. I've been particularly interested and fascinated with the history of the, of the town during the Civil War and its role during the Civil War. But I think to better understand, understand Ashland's participation during those years, you got to know a little bit about the early years of Ashland. So I'm just going to give you a quick lesson in, in the first years leading, leading up to the war. In 1834, a new company was incorporated in Richmond. It's called the Richmond, Franksburg, and Potomac Railroad. By 1836, the railroad had bought the property, which is now Ashland and ran tracks up as far as the South Anna River. At that point, they would bring ex excursion trains up from the city, taking people up to the South Anna on a picnic, and then bringing them back. Very shortly thereafter, they ran tracks to Fredsburg and then to a bar landing on the Potomac River. And from that point, the passengers would get on a steamboat, go up the Potomac to Washington. So, at that period of time, this area was called Ashland, uh, Adams Shanty. Now, Mr. Adams was the guy who cut wood, provided to the locomotives that came through here. But as time went on, and a mineral spring was discovered somewhere on what is now the Round of Lincoln campus, the railroad realized there's money to be made in this place. I mean, mineral springs in the 1840s and 50s were the thing. You went to take the waters. 
So they thought, well, gee, we got mineral springs, we can get some other things. So they proceeded to build a hotel and a ballroom. And you can see up here on the, this is the graph, which is undated, but um, we think it's sometime probably in the late 40s, probably early 50s. And you see here, this is, this is the hotel. And at this point, it was called Slash Cottage because, yeah, Ashland sits on pretty flat ground. It gets a little swampy here. So the slashes that grow in the swamp gave the name Slash Cottage. They built a ballroom. This was the kitchen in the kitchen garden. <laughs> I love that. This was the, was the gas works. They made, they manufactured their own gas so that they could power the lights in these various buildings from the gas that came from this little building right here. So, this may be a fairly fanciful picture of what it actually looked at, looked like, but I expect it's pretty close. And here you have a vacation haven in the middle of the wilderness. And they knew, and they advertised, and they were very successful in getting residents from Richmond to come out here and spend as much as two weeks of time just getting out into the fresh air of the country. Now, then they decide, well, we're going to sell lots. Maybe we can get people more than just part-time. Maybe we can get full-time people out here. So they started selling lots up and down the railroad tracks. And interesting to note <laughs> that in the early deeds of those lots, there was a clause in there that says, you cannot sell spiritless liquors on this property. <laughs> and that was a requirement from the railroad because they were selling that up here. So they were not competition. A race track and jockey club was established. Some of the finest thoroughbreds in the country ran on this track. Most notably was Planet from the Bookfield Stables in Dawson. And in 1855, the name was changed from Slash Cottage to Ashland in honor of Henry Clay's home in Kentucky. All right, now our, the town's first connection, I guess, or association with military events <clears throat> took place in 1858. And it wasn't anything like what they would experience during the war, but it was a little touch of military. Again, Edwin Robinson, who was president at the time of the RFP, saw there might be some money to be made in having the 1st Virginia Regiment, which was station in Richmond, to come out here for their summer encampment. The militia back in that time was very much like the National Guard today in that it had a summer encampment every year. So, Mr. Robinson called Colonel August, who was commander of the 1st Regiment of Militia, and said, look, I got the deal for you. We'll bring you out here on the train. We can put the officers up in the hotel and cottages we have and other private homes we have here in the town. And we know where you can do your drilling. And you can come out and just think of it. Think of it, Colonel. You can have dances and balls and parties in the ballroom and in the hotel. And believe it, back in that time, the membership in the militia was as much of a social thing as it was a military thing, maybe more of a social thing, to be honest. So that was appealing. And he said, absolutely, let's do it. So we give you Camp Robinson, named after Edward Robinson. This camp took place, uh, at least the drilling part of this, and some of the encampment itself took place at what's now Maplewood Farm at the end of Hanover Avenue, just a little west of Woodland Cemetery. Um, the regiment was 
consisting of companies like the Richmond Blues, the Richmond Braves, Montgomery Guards, several others. They had an artillery uh, unit associated with, with this regiment. So, if you read the Richmond Dispatch columns of the day, articles, you will see that they had a high old time. They loved that. So Mr. Robinson and was pleased, Colonel August was pleased. And so that's that's Camp Robinson, that was our first first encounter with the military. And it's significant in that it was one of the last, if not the last, peacetime encounter encampment within the state. On April 17, 61, Virginia passed the Ordinance of Secession after much debate over many months. And it's interesting to note that none of the Ashton residents, residents voted against it. Everybody was enthused. Yes, absolutely, we secede for my own country. We can do it. We can beat the Yankees if they want to come to town. So now, the role of Ashton changes significantly. We go from a vacation spot to one of large military ports. And think about it, we are 15, 20 miles north of Richmond. We are on the tracks. We already have depot here. We already have some facilities here. We have good roads. It's relatively flat, flat land for training purposes, drill purposes. So, it's decided by the Confederate government that Ashland is going to be important in this operation. The first thing we're going to do is we're going to make it a spot for mustering in companies to Confederate service, Confederate military service. And there are a bunch of them that were mustered in right here in this town. Uh, for instance, St. George Tucker's Ashton Braves originally organized in 18, December of 1860 was mustered in as Company E of the 15th Virginia Regiment. And as you can see here, these two distinguished gentlemen. Is that you on the left? What? Is that you on the left? That's you on the left. <laughs> that was, that was, yeah, I let my head go over. The fellow on the right is Callum Jones. Callum uh, was a local boy. He was Hunter Jones's grandfather, and many of you remember Hunter Jones. Um, and as a matter of fact, we have his great granddaughter right here tonight, Sandra Smith. <laughs> but you can notice, I mean, this is a typical uniform of the day for these militia units. There was, there was no uniformity, no consistency in what they wore, and the fancier they got, the better it was, right? You notice on the hat, each hat is an AG, of course, for Ashland Guard. This next slide is a coat button that I happen to have, and it is the same letters, Ash, uh, AG for Ashland Guard. It has been attributed to the Ashland Graves, the Ashland Graves, not Guard. It has been attributed to the Graves. Several have been uh, found and dug on various battlefields and campsites. So, Callum would have been wearing that button on his coat. Unfortunately, as was the practice of the day, when these photographs were taken, in order to give them a little more brassy look, the photographer would take brass paint and cover the buttons just to make them pop up a little bit. So you can't read what's on that button, and that's unfortunate, but that's just what they like to do. Pitchburg Woolfolk of Carolina County formed the Ashland Artillery, which served uh, as an artillery battery throughout the war. And Williams Wickham 
mustered in the Hanover Troop as Company G of the 4th Virginia Cavalry. Uh, this is a reunion picture taken in 1890. Uh, it was taken in Ashland Park, which was a popular area of its day. Ashland Park was right on the railroad tracks just north of Archie Cannon Drive. Um, anyway, this picture is of close interest to me. That's, that's my great-grandfather, Thomas Elliott Gilman. That's his brother, John Richard Gilman. My great-great-grandfather, John Harris Blunt. And a bunch of other uncles and cousins in here. So I got, I got a lot of attachment to this particular group of people. <laughs> so, okay, it's a mustard point. But what else can it be? Well, we have a depot here. We can build warehouses. So the Confederate, the Confederate government wants to turn this into a supply depot to supply the armies that are north, right? Makes perfect sense. And as we just talked, it's flat ground over here. What a great place to set up a training camp. So Camp Ashland comes into, into being. Um, the camp was additionally initially uh, commanded by Colonel Richard Yule. Richard Yule later became a general under Stonewall Jackson. And when Jackson was mortally wounded at Chancellorsville, he took over the command of the Second Corps of the Army of Northern Virginia. He was then followed by Robert Chilton as commander of the camp. And Robert had quite a career himself in the war. He was chief of staff for Robert E. Lee for a while, and he later became a general. Uh, following Chilton was Charles Field, who also became a general in the Confederate Army later in the war. And you, you got to realize, too, again, we were talking about the militia camp and what a big social deal that was. Well, it was still social here, because these guys were going to have fun. They knew this was going to be a blast, right? War was going to be great. But it was still very much a social event. And with the, build, with the buildings at the college that we've already talked about, the pretty girls of the residents are here that they could flirt with were all inducements and excitements to get them to want to come to Ash. Thousands of men from over 30 companies trained here. Most were from Virginia, except for a cavalry unit from South Carolina called Hampton's Legion and one from Mississippi called the Jeff Davis Legion. The most noted trainee at this camp was John Singleton Mosby. At the time, he was just in the other private, but would, of course, later become the Great Ghost and the commander of Mosby's Raiders up in Northern Virginia. The Richmond Daily Dispatch reported on May 24, 1861. The several battalions of infantry heretofore domiciled in Ashland have received marching orders in the last few days. Nearly enough to form a good sized regiment had gone down the river bound east. They were heading towards Yorktown. Some 1,500 or 2,000 cavalry will be at Ashland in a few days. Indeed, a large force of that arm of the service is there already. So, the camp that had originally been set up for both training infantry and cavalry now became a cavalry only training facility. As all of the infantry companies had left, gone for duty elsewhere. So, the officers of the camp, of the Calvary officers were housed in the hotel, uh, in the jockey club, which was on Center Street, uh, and in some private homes. The men were in tents uh, surrounding the area, uh, particularly around the racetrack, which was just southwest, a little bit of the southwest part of the town. The Gooseman Calvary Company, though, had a little better. They were housed at the Methodist Church which was probably the original building site of the present day Masonic Lodge on Route 54. Now, 
Now, I find it very interesting, and I learned more about the camp than I think from any other source by reading some of the letters that the soldiers wrote back home. Right? So, William Corson was a member of Company G, 3rd Virginia Cavalry, which was the Cumberland Troop. And he writes on you know, May the 25th, 1861, to his girlfriend, Jenny. We are comfortably quartered at the Ashen Racecourse in a section of the country as level as the prairies of the West. Our men are in houses protected from inclement weather. Our horses do not fare so well, but are picketed in an enclosure where they're in the shelter. We are on duty nearly all day. The bugle calls at 4.30. In the morning, at six, every trooper is required to answer to his name unless on guard or in the hospital, and get fed a feed for his horse. At 6.30 is breakfast call, seven to walk with horses, eight mounted drill, when all the troops in the regiment composed of 10 are marched out to the field and drill for three hours. At 12, water and feed again. 12.30, dinner, two, foot drill, five o'clock inspection of arms. Sundown dress parade when the whole regiment is marched to a beautiful grove where the officers of the different companies report their number of men on the drill. On June 11th, Private Corson wrote to his girlfriend Jenny, we went around the town serenading the ladies that have been so kind to us soldiers. We are welcomed at several places and treated to whiskey and water. We shall be relieved, reluctant to leave the good people of Ashland. And you bet they will. <laughs> On June 20, he wrote, I hope we will not be sent from this place until all the water birds are gone. That's blueberries. For there are many more bushes here than I ever saw anywhere in my life. This is a great country for watermelons. And if we remain here during the summer, we will feast on them. On July the 1st, 1861, Richard Watkins, who was a member of the Prince Edward Dragoons, Company K of the 3rd Virginia Roads, to his wife, wish you could come and see us. It has rained nearly all the time that we've been here. This place ought to be called Slash Cottage. <laughs> On July 4th, he writes, when I wrote before, it was raining constantly, and I thought Slash Cottage had a proper name for the place. But since the dust begins to rise, I think that Ashland or Ashes Land would be <laughs> And on August 17th, and I find this particularly interesting because this gives you a good idea of what the living conditions were for the enlisted man, not the officers, but the enlisted man at this camp. On August 17th, he wrote, our quarters consist of a row of white tents fronting, fronting south with the row of stables that opposite face the north. I am lying down in one of the tents on the bed of my roommates, which consists of a large pile of straw, of straw covered with blankets. On one side of the bed is a water mountain, a pair of bolsters, a pair of coarse government shoes, a pair of government gray pants, a saber, a pair of spurs, a pair of thin shoes. At the foot of the bed is a large gun box, turned on its side and filled with clothes, sabers, etc. On the gun box is a candlestick, two testaments, a little mirror, a bottle of ink, a pair of buckskin gloves, a clean calico shirt, and a pair of dark green breeches. So, doesn't sound like the Hotel Jefferson, but you know, it doesn't sound terrible. Now, understand that all the guys that show up here for the most part were green. They had little or no military training, officers or men. So, how do we drill these soldiers and what they need to know and be able to do when we don't know how to do it ourselves? So they were having a difficult time in drilling these troops, but luckily about 30 cadets from BMI showed up to aid in the instruction, and that kind of smoothed things out. Now, a member from the Hampton Legion 
of South Carolina had these comments. And this was after he left the camp. I must admit I feel a relief from the rush of work and drill at Ashland. The drill that we went through every day there was pretty severe, and there were so many men coming and going all the time. It was indeed a vast camp, but no fortifications about it. We drilled for hours every morning and evening. Now, the same soldier also wrote, I have never seen in all my days so much whiskey, and it's so cheap. <laughs> While I was in Ashland, most of the men got their meals at the hotel, which is as cheap as we could prepare them. And all the spare time between drills, the men uh, usually drank and abused the officers to their heart's content. <laughs> By June and July, many of the troops had left Ashland and headed north to join the army at Manassas. Uh, shortly thereafter, the camp went out of existence. Uh, the latest reference that I can find to it that is uh, August 23rd. Now Ashland takes on a new role. We take on a role of providing hospital spaces and spaces for refugees. Because by this time, the Confederate Army is moving back from Manassas, where it had spent the winter of 1861-62. They're coming back in the direction of Ashland uh, to eventually go <coughs> on the peninsula, heading towards Yorktown to prevent McClellan and his Union force from coming up the peninsula and taking Richmond. Now, as they come to this area, well, what comes with them? but a bunch of sick soldiers. Now these are soldiers that were suffering from diseases, not from wounds, but from sickness. In the Civil War, people died two to one, sickness to wounds. It was a big deal. These guys had come from farms and rural areas. They, they had no immunity to anything, to nothing. So we get here in Ashland, and we've, we've, we've got a problem. We have all these sick soldiers and nowhere to care for them, so they, they set up hospitals in a number of places to nurse the sick. Um, and the buildings and homes that we have seen the reference to are uh, the Baptist Church, the hotel, this is a post-war picture of the hotel on the Randolph-Macon campus. <coughs> and the Baptist Church is also a, a post-war picture. Uh, just a few years after the war, as a matter of fact. The private homes, the home of S.D. Leak, the home of R.R. Sale, the Hughes home, the Free Church, the Methodist Church, General Hospital and Hospital Number One. Well, places like the General Hospital and Hospital Number One, we don't really know exactly where they were. Uh, they might have been, they might have been hospitals associated with the camp around the railroad, uh, around the uh, racetrack. They might have been associated with the college. But we do know they were they were hospitals. And what else we know is that. A lot of those men died, and now we have a new problem. What do we do with all these dead soldiers? So, beginning in April of 1862, a group of citizens from Ashland, and I'm sure some military authorities, bought a half acre of ground west of town from a, a free black lady by the name of Elizabeth Tinsley Hall. It was a half an acre. I think, as I understand, she did not get paid anything at the time, but she did receive $5 or something a year or two after the war. At least then she got real good currency, didn't have to you know, get Confederacy, Confederate currency. What you are seeing here is 
what we call the Ashen Third or book. There are over 250 people listed in this book. And you see on the very first page, uh, the Robert James and brothers, Robert James and his brothers apparently were conducting the burials at this plot of land. Probably also many of the coffins. And this is what became the very beginning of Woodland Cemetery. And you can go out there today and you can see the area that these soldiers are buried in. Now, the burial book gave us some really good detailed information because for years I always heard as a child, well, they're out there in unmarked graves. We don't know who they are. That's all we'll take. They died nationally. That's all we know. That they're buried out here. Well, this book. Right, will tell you in detail who they were. You've got Mr. Breedlove here, for instance, member of the 22nd North Carolina. He died at GH, which we're assuming is General Hospital. And he even tells you what grave he's, he's buried in. Problem is, we don't know what number where number seven or number five or any of those numbers are in relation to the other graves there. But overall, it's a wonderful source because it tells you a lot about what these soldiers are going through and who never left Ashland. Now, we speak of refugees. Um, Mrs. Judith McGuire was herself a refugee from Eastern Hanover County. And she wrote on April 12, 1863, that the hotel was full of refugees. The ballroom was occupied and the long dining room was partitioned into rooms by Dallas curtains. Because understand, the Union Army was coming up from Yorktown, up the peninsula, through Williamsburg, getting closer and closer to Richmond. A lot of these people were scared to death. They did not want to stay at their home. So they left. And what's on the way when you got Richmond, you also got Ashton. So a lot of these folks came to Ashton. And as Ms. McGuire said, they were put up in facilities of the college and also into private homes. Now, in June of 1862, Stonewall Jackson, Stonewall Jackson's army was coming from the Shenandoah Valley to meet up with Lee's army in Mechanicsville. He brought with him about 20,000 people. They spent the night in Ashland on the way to Mechanicsville, and he stayed at the McMurray House. The, uh, this is a post-war, this is about 1890 photo of the McMurray House. And this is where he spent the night and where he met with Richard Buell and also Jeff Stewart to talk about what was going on in Mechanicsville and how they would move his army to uh, meet up with, with Lee's army. So for those of you who are familiar with where this house is, which it still stands on Center Street, you see no street here because McMurray Street didn't exist back in that time. Uh, Mr. McMurray was a treasurer of the RFP, and he, he owned that land, I think, all the way back to Road 1. But McMurray Street was not there to, to cut it apart. Now, let me bring you up to date on, on a bit of a modern story about the McMurray House and Stonewall Jackson. I guess this was in the 80s or oh, very early 90s, eight, uh, 1990s, 1980s. <laughs> there was a, um, a truck accident, a block or two behind McMurray House. Well, the truck turned over and apparently there was chemicals involved that spilled. So the police closed off all the surrounding area, all the streets within a certain proximity of that accident. And it was featured in the Richmond News, what was going on in Ashland, this was big time stuff. Well, my father lived next door to the McMurray house at that time. And my father was so, so 
interested in Ashland history. And he so loved to talk to people about Ashland history. I swear you could talk to a telephone pole. <laughs> so he goes outside and he sees this news reporter, I think from Channel 6, standing at the corner of McMurder and Center. So he goes over there to talk to him, find out what he knows, etc. And he said, let me tell you something about this house. I bet you didn't know that Jackson spent the night here. And the reporter said, no kidding, which one, Jesse or Reggie? <laughs> My father was furious. I said, well, what'd you say? He said, I told him it was Stonewall Jackson and turned and walked on. <laughs> Ms. McMurdo said that the general didn't sleep at all that night. He was in an upstairs bedroom. But he paced back and forth and just sat in the rocking chair the whole time. Matter of fact, he, um, she donated that rocking chair to uh, the Jackson Shrine up at Guinea Station where Jackson died. So anyway, the next day he leaves for Mechanicsville. But it wasn't our only visit from Stonewall. Stonewall visited Ashland again on July 15th, 1862. Now this time, he's coming from the Seven Days Battles, heading kind of northwest that will culminate in the Second Battle of Manassas in August of 1862. But he stops by at a roadside house in Ashland. And he was listening to a girl, a young girl playing the piano and singing and he asked, won't you play a piece of music called Dixie? I heard it a few days ago and thought it was good. The girl protested that she had just sung Dixie. And Jackson replied, ah, indeed, I didn't know it. So the great general must have been a little tone deaf, but he, he was a heck of a general. All right. A new phase now for Ashland. We do have some armies going through, stopping over, but not much destruction, damage, death. But that changes. The Union Army recognized the importance of this area, the same as the Confederate government did. It was no big surprise. We got supply depots here. Right? We got a railroad depot. We got a railroad tracks running right through the middle of it, north to south. Great. We need to get rid of that. So, the first cavalry raid occurred on May the 28th, 1862. The cavalry broke up the railroad and telegraph and the bridge over Stony Creek, according to General McClellan's official report. Now, the second raid occurred on May the 3rd, 1863, when the town was attacked by federal cavalry under General Stoneman. Now, Lee and Hooker were facing off at Chancellorsville at that time, but General Stoneman was told, take your cavalry south, south of Fredericksburg, destroy as much of the railroad tracks equipment, stores, rolling stock as you can find and accomplish. And that he did. Speaking of the Battle of Chancellorsville, Judith McGuire, who we just talked about as a refugee that was staying at Prophet Hotel, noted in her diary that the town residents could hear the cannon fire from Chancellorsville. So, you know what noisy that was. But anyway, the Union soldiers got here they cut the telegraph wire and tore up 200 yards of rails. They also destroyed a trestle south of town, probably where the tracks go over Stony Run. And while the, trade, the raid, uh, while the raid was going on, a train approached from the north. It was captured, the engine was uncoupled and burned. The seven-car train was an ambulance train carrying 250 sick and wounded soldiers and several prominent civilians. Well, the wounded were all paroled. I don't know what happened to the civilians. 
But one of the passages was made to General Jackson, and he was on his way to get Mrs. Jackson to bring her to any station to be with the general. Uh, fortunately, she made it there before his death. The Federals also destroyed a wood train and locomotives to Thomas Sharp and the Nicholas Mills. They found a large stable filled with mules and horses. They took, they took some but left most and destroyed 20 wagons and harness sets found at the stable. And I read in some account of this, and I forget now where, but I think it was on this read, that while they were doing their damage to the, to the railroad, there was a girls' school a block away. Well, the girls had been evacuated, so nobody was there. But I would go on the thing and go sit on the bed and read their diaries and letters. Maybe you know, that's a sorry thing to do. I mean, burn the depot. That's a, we understand that, but you know, that's, that's kind of sorry. It's no more. All right, a third raid occurred July 5th, 1863. Federals destroyed the telegraph office, cut down telegraph poles, and tore up the tracks, set fire to the depot, and left. Fourth raid, March 4th, 1st, 1864. Judson's Judson Kilpatrick's Union cavalry were on their way to Richmond, and they raided the town on the way. About 450 Federals clashed with Confederate pickets who were easily defeated and captured. But the only damage done that day was cutting of telegraph lines to Richmond. A fifth raid occurred when Stolen Sheriff's Cavalry attacked the town on May 11th, 1864, on the way to Yellow Tavern. The Federals destroyed a locomotive with train cars, several government storehouses, culverts, and six, six miles of track. They were driven off by the Second Virginia Cavalry under Fitzhugh Lee. The next day, Ms. Jeff Stewart, who was living in Beaverdam at the time, was notified of her husband's wounding at Yellow Tavern. She took the train trying to get to Richmond, but she could get no further with action because the train, uh, the tracks were torn up. So they had to break, put her in a wagon to get her to Richmond. Sadly, she got there after Stewart had died. Now on June 1st, 1864, the town was raided by federal cavalry for the sixth time. But this wasn't your run of the mill raid. This has become known as the Battle of Ashton. Now, talk about this first. Grant and Lee facing off at Cold Harbor. Okay? Terrifically big, bloody battle. General James Wilson had a large number of Union cavalry at Hannibal Courthouse. So he was given orders to do two things. One, to destroy the railroad bridges over the South Anna the Virginia Central Bridge over the South Anna, and also the Arkansas Bridge over the South Anna. Also, go to Ashland, destroy as much as they could there. Now, to accomplish his goal, he, he split his division into two groups. The 18th Pennsylvania, the 2nd New York, the 1st Vermont Cavalry, and the Colonel Chapman traveled southwest along what is now the Hickory Hill Road to destroy the bridges. So, this is the courthouse, it's right in here. This is Hickory Hill Plantation. This is the Hickory Hill Road. All right, still there. And you had tracks here and you had tracks with bridges here. Okay, so that's Virginia Central. This is the RFT. Now the second group that would attack the town was 
under Colonel McIntosh, who was uh, his first Connecticut, the second Ohio, the third New York Cavalry. And they came down the Asher Road to the town. Now the Asher Road is running from Hickory Hill right down here to the town. This road, for the most part, does not exist any longer. Certainly as a public road. But where it came in here and intersected with Telegraph Road is pretty much where Road 54 intersects today with Road 1. Uh, it's a little bit south of the intersection, but it's close enough for this presentation, okay? The third road that you need to pay attention to and be aware of is the Telegraph Road itself, which ran from up here, Hickory Hill, I mean, Hickory Hill Road, on down here through Ashland. So, you've got this triangle. So, for purposes of this presentation, when we talk the Hickory Hill Road, you can think of that road because it's still there. When we talk of the Telegraph Road, you think of Road 1. That pretty much follows the same track as Telegraph Road, particularly as it goes through Ashland. Okay? And again, the Ashland Road, at least up into this part, you can think of as Route 54. <clears throat> now, Chapman had a fairly easy time of it. Um, and he was the one coming down Hickory Hill Road and was going to destroy those railroad bridges over the South Down River. Well, he did not meet any opposition until he was getting closer to Ellis Crossing, which is right up here. And at that point, he was met by troopers from the 1st Maryland Cavalry and the Baltimore Light Artillery, commanded by Colonel Bradley Johnson. But since the Maryland troopers could only muster about 150 men, they were quickly pushed back and retreated towards Ashland. So at that point, Chapman, who had already destroyed the bridge of the Virginia Central over the South Island, could now proceed to the Arthur P. Bridge, which he destroyed. Now, this photograph is not the Arthur P. Bridge over the South Island. But it is the RP bridge over the North Island, which had been destroyed just a week before. Um, ironically, it was destroyed by Confederate troops who wanted to keep the Union forces from using it to cross the river. But you can imagine that the bridge over the South Island looked very, very much like what you see in that photograph. Macintosh's troops coming out of the Ashen Road didn't fare so well. What they didn't know is that in this area here, that was a large number of Confederate cavalry under General Wade Hampton, who took command of the Confederate cavalry up to Stewart's death. Um, Hampton had the divisions of Rooney Lee, who was the son of Bobby Lee, and Tom Roster. And they gave the Federals all they could handle. So, as the troops, McIntosh's troops came down the Ashland Road and headed, headed on to Ashland to start restoring tracks, the first Connecticut was bringing up the rear. At Ross's signal, General Tom Ross's signal, Colonel Thomas Massey's 12th Virginia Cavalry pitched into the first Connecticut, came down upon them like lice in Egypt, if a federal said of the unexpected assault. The servants were riding and leading the pack animals, of course, were terribly scared and dashed right down the road through the center of our regiment, throwing it for some time being into some confusion. <coughs> While the New Englanders scattered, Ross's Virginians loaded up on delicacies from the Union wagons and captured McIntosh's spare mounts 
accompanied the rear guard. Now, the Ohio troops, which had already passed that point and were tearing up tracks from Ashland, heard the firing of the Battle of Corp. 1st Connecticut and came to its help. Rosser goes on to say, the additional Federals caught us by surprise. I had kept only two squadrons in the saddle and encumbered. The balance of the command was guarding the prisoners and the captured property was scattered along the road for over a mile. And at this point, men were fighting at close quarters, firing pistols and slashing with sabers. Rosser continued, everything was about to break. When Private Holmes Conrad, who was by my side, rushed to the 11th Virginia, seized his collar and called up to his old comrades to save their flag that had waved triumphantly upon so many glorious fields and rushed with it into the ranks of the enemy. The Virginians piled into the Union troops and regained the initiative. Hampton later put it, Rosser pressed the enemy vigorously and in a series of brilliant charges some of which were over dismounted men, he drove the last of McIntosh's troopers into Ashland. Federals were posted in houses that finally stopped Rosser's progress with a galling fire. Now, while Rosser was mauling the rear guard, Rooney Lee with his two brigades, one of Pierce Young's North Carolinians and John Chambliss's Virginians, Okay. Rosser was down in here. Rooney Lee with the troops of Young and what was the other? Chambers. Sorry, John Chambers. They were above north of the Ashen Road. So while Rosser was attacking from the south, Hampton saw the real possibility that if he created a pincer with Ruby Lee's troops in the north, they could bottle up McIntosh's troops in Ashland and destroy it completely. <coughs> Hampton began his attack by sending Young's Tar Heel in a headlong charge to break McIntosh's line between Telegraph Road and Ashland Road. Elements from Hammonds and Marcy's Federal regiments, deadlock Young in better fight. Young, who was an exceedingly handsome, gallant, and enterprising officer, Union General Wilson later described, fell wounded when a ball passed through his left breast and exited near his left shoulder. Fortunately, Young recovered and later became a, a general in the cavalry and served with some distinction. But going on, a Confederate recalled when the North Carolinians ran low on ammunition, they fought the enemy with stones and brick bats. Hammond's Federals, armed with seven shot Spencer cartridges, carbines, held firm, killing and wounding more than 70 Confederates of Baker's 3rd North Carolina Cavalry. Now, Union Colonel McIntosh knew he was in hot water here because he was being pushed from the south by Rosser, from the north by Lee, and also by Bradley Johnson with the Maryland troops. He managed to get a courier through the Maryland line up to Ellis Crossing where Chapman was in the business of destroying the railroad bridge, asking for help and help he got. Cavalry from the 1st Vermont Regiment pushed its way through Bradley Johnson's line and came to assist McIntosh in the town. McIntosh then sent an east to assist the 1st Connecticut against Rosser, south of Telegraph Road to help defend against Rudy Lee. And I'm quoting here from an Ohio soldier who said, the sounds of combat rattled through the streets of Ashland. Both sides fought dismounted, often at close quarters. It was strange but true to see rebel and Union soldiers 
firing from opposite sides of the same tree. The rebels were so thick that we could scarcely miss them if we fired at random, and few shots went astray. Both sides were now taking heavy losses. In the space of 40 feet, I counted 22 dead rebels, and there was a large number wounded, also from an Ohio trooper. But McIntosh now requested more reinforcements. So the remainder of the first remark, Vermont came down from Ellet Crossing into Ashland to provide some relief. His Fargo troopers, and I'm sorry, McIntosh's Fargo troopers then were able to leave and head north, get out of town quick, because they had been just fought out. A few Connecticut soldiers lingered at the depot long enough to bury their commander. Captain Addison G. Warner in the neighboring yard. The Confederates were close to overcoming first Vermont when the 5th New York, along with Spencer Carbines, came to the rescue. And that was a saving grace for the Union Army that day, were the seven shot Spencer Carbines. The Confederates are number man wise, but they could not match that firepower. It was said of the Spencer carbine, you could load it on Sunday and fire it all week. And that was the truth. The Richmond Dispatch later reported that many of the Yankees were in the ballroom of the hotel at the time, and when the Confederates charged, the Yankees bounded out the front windows and doors as the rebels bounded in the rear windows and doors. Many of the Union cavalry that were killed <clears throat> excuse me, uh, a wounded at that point, left 13 dead lying outside of the hotel. In the end, the Union lost 183 men, the Confederate lost approximately 190. That's big numbers, particularly for a cavalry fight. That's big numbers. So the raids that had taken place prior to this all paled in comparison to what the town had just been through on June 1st. Now, what you'll see here is, a, is an envelope which I purchased on eBay, as a matter of fact, a few years back. And it's, it's the ink is fairly faded, so I'm not sure how well you can read it. But let me say this first. Uh, this document and a couple others that you'll see in a minute, uh, I have here on the table. So if you want to get a closer look at them, you can come up here and see them as you read. But anyway, this envelope says, this is a rebel envelope captured at Ashland Station, June 1st, 1864, signed by J.B. DuBois. Now, I think J.B. DuBois was a member of the 5th New York Cavalry. But I have often wondered that before this envelope was captured, did it put up much of a fight? <laughs> or did he just lay on his arms and said, take me? <laughs> if, if it's the same J.B. Bois that I have seen on uh, when I was doing some research on this particular piece, uh, like I said, a member of the 5th, 5th New York Cavalry, sad to say that he was captured two weeks later, just east of Richmond, and he died shortly thereafter in Andersonville Prison in Georgia. One Confederate later said that the fight at Ashland was one of the severest cavalry battles of the war. And he was, he was right in that. All right, there are no accounts of further action until March the 15th, 1865, when the town was raided for a seventh time. This time, General George Custer's Union Army raided the town, um, but they were attacked and withdrew around nightfall. <coughs> the war was over in less than a month later. Now, the war is over. But the war hadn't finished with Ashland quite yet. Following 
Lee's surrender at Appomattox in April, the Federals created a provost marshal's office here in Ashland, and also a uh, branch of the Freedmen's Bureau, which was here to help the newly emancipated slaves. The provost office was here for a couple of reasons. One was to keep the peace. And the other was is to parole officer or uh, soldiers, <coughs> excuse me, that had been parole, patrol, but uh, paroled at Appomattox. And this is an example of one parole document right here. It was for a Joseph H. Crew, and it's noted Ashland, April something, 1865. And this is his parole. And this was his pass that he was also given uh, a Bundy McBean parole, which uh, said that he can pass from these headquarters in Hanover County via Ashland for the purpose of marketing. Okay, so he had to carry this with him everywhere he went, at least as far as long as the provost marshal's office was here in town. And it was Virginia at that time, of course, was under military control. So, the war is over. Ashland is devastated along with the rest of the state of Virginia. But, the railroad. The railroad who built it, who nourished it, who darn near got it destroyed, now rebuilt it. And three years later, Randolph Macon came up here and took over the railroad property on the campus that you, where you are today. But that's another story for another time. So I, I've taken up as, as much of your time as I think I can or should tonight. But I do thank you again for, com uh, for coming and I will ask for those of you who are still awake, if you have, if you have any questions, anything you would like to know that perhaps I didn't cover or talk about or Hey. Uh, just wondering if anyone still knows where that mineral spring was on the campus. <laughs> you know, not to my knowledge. I don't even think Roseanne Chow knows. <laughs> and if that's the case, nobody knows. Uh, it's just somewhere that, here, but I don't know. Dr. Scannon? That's right. I've never <laughs> seen any reference to the spring in the Tuskegee. <laughs> <laughs> sure. But I, I have a comment, a question. The comment is you mentioned General Stone. I think he's the same General Stoneman who was the governor, the military governor of Virginia in 1868. He certainly could have been. I mean, he and, was up and, there in the end. Huh? That General Stoneman quashed a court order from the Mecklenburg court, which would have denied Randolph Bacon the ability to move to Ashland. So, so it was Stoneman who enabled that to happen. If it's the same man. So Stone was our enemy in '63, but our yes. friend in '68. Yeah. I, I think. I, I think you're right, James. I, I think you are. And, and one question: You mentioned Rooney Lee mm -hmm. at uh, on Hickory Hill. I was riding one day with Bill McElwain, who knew an astronomical amount. And he said that Rooney Lee was captured at Hickory Hill? Rooney Lee had been wounded at, at Williamsburg. Uh, uh, not at, in that battle? No, no. Oh, okay. Well, he'd been wounded at Williamsburg as the army was retreating back towards Richmond. Okay, he was wounded. He was married to General Wickham's oh. sister. So they took him to Hickory Hill to recuperate. When the Union Cavalry showed up, uh, one of his brothers, is either Robert or Custis, were there visiting too. They had hid in the boxwood, three boxwoods, and got away from it. But Rooney was taken prisoner and taken down to Fort Monroe for a while before he was pulled for exchange. Thank you. Thank you. Anything else?
It's kind of hard to see what that date is, but anyway, yes. Uh, 1865, mm -hmm. it expires 1860. This pass will expire in May, uh, it looks like 31st, April. Uh, 1865. It was originally issued on April 27th, so yes, it was only a temporary pass. He would have to go and get that renewed uh, to continue moving around freely okay. in the country. Yeah, no, that's, that's a five. That's 1865. Uh, the expiration date was 1865. Just the time. Yes, sir. Woody, um, I'm interested in trains, and I know you've been in probably every backyard in Ashland with a metal detector. <laughs> <laughs> did, did you ever find any pieces of the engines or trains or wheels or anything Bottle. in Ashland, or were Bottle. they? Or were they repurposed, or did people use them in their houses for anything? You know, Hill, that's a good question, and I don't really have a good answer for it. Uh, I can say no, that I recall that I haven't found anything that was railroad related. Um, of course, I did find a lot of stuff that I didn't know what the heck it was. <laughs> it could have been off of a, off of a train. But uh, as to what they did with it, I'm sure a lot of it was repurposed because the Confederate government didn't have much to start with, so they weren't going to let it go if they could rebuild it or repurpose it or reuse it somehow. Yes, sir. How, how far north did the tracks go during the war? If they weren't destroyed, you, you mentioned that something happened up in Aquia that people would get on a boat to go farther north. Did it ever get extended, you know, like to D.C. or farther during the war? Not during the war, I don't think. I'm pretty sure of that. I think it wasn't until after the war that those tracks left the choir and, and went straight on into the district. Uh, I don't think it was done before the war. I could be wrong on that, but I, I don't believe so. <laughs> Any other questions? Woody, is, is uh, Stonewall Jackson's ghost still in that house? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Some lady who lived in that house told me that her dog talked to him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I heard that story. I, I, I remember that lady. Uh, a lot of ghosts talk to her, I think. <laughs> um, I have not heard of any, any occurrence from the current residents, so I'm going to assume that that ghost has now gone to its grave, whoever it was. All right, well, thank you again for coming. A lot, part of, a lot of this presentation was dependent on a couple books. One is Leaving Neither White Child Nor Father, which is a wonderful history that has been written by Jim Upton about the early history of Ashland right on up through the early history of Woodland Cemetery and the hospital phase of Ashland's existence during the war. Uh, I mean, I just touched on a minute amount of information that Jim has put into this book, along with military biographies of all the soldiers that are buried in Woodland Cemetery. So Jim is with us today. I want to thank you for a wonderful resource, a wonderful treasure. <laughs> it was the sale in the Ashton Museum. Okay, so if you're interested in the history of this type, I highly recommend this book. It is well documented, well illustrated, very well presented. So check it out. The other one I want to just let you know about, because I use it extensively in my research, was the book by Gordon Ray called Cold Harbor. And the main focus is the Battle of Cold Harbor, but it has the most in-depth description of the Battle of Ashland, June 1st, 1864, any that I have ever read. 
I highly recommend it. Again, if you're interested in this period of history, it is out of print, but you can go online and find it pretty easily. So again, thank you. Have a good night.